I'm so glad to welcome all of you to um, today's session, Delivering at the Speed of Need. And so um, I've seen in, from the chats that a lot of you can see the screen, so perfect. And so I'm just gonna quick, give a quick wrap, uh, overview about what to expect in the next hour and a half. And so today's workshop has three parts, but I'm going to introduce you first to my colleagues. And so Catherine Benjamin, go ahead, Catherine. Also my colleague, Katie Lalon. And so in terms of part one, Catherine's going to talk about scoping and how to do intake for projects in order to deliver at the speed of need. Also, and then followed by that, Katie will share how to build agile multidisciplinary teams. And then um, following Katie, I will be uh, talking about how to set up uh, proper governance structures and talk about the role in um, pretty much advancing delivery. And so the three of us will be um, going through a few interactive exercises for which we will ask you to have two things. So very low tech this time, a piece of paper and a pen. So that's it. And with that, we could get started with Catherine. Awesome. Thank you for everyone. I lost my cursor and therefore could not unmute myself, but we're back in. I'm going to quickly jump backwards in time because the one thing Honey was unable to do due to my inability to unmute myself uh, was to just quickly do a land acknowledgement. So I'm going to start and then hand it over to Honey and Katie. So I'm a native Vancouverite. So I'm, I grew up on the area that is the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people. So that's the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam First Nations. And I'll hand it over to Katie to provide the acknowledgement uh, for Toronto. Hi everyone, Honey and I are both joining uh, from different parts of Toronto today. And Toronto is traditionally a gathering place for many nations, including the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. I want to acknowledge that we are meeting in the area covered by Treaty 13, also known as the Toronto Purchase, and pay my respects to the Mississaugas of the credit. Awesome, thank you Katie. So with that, I will kick off our presentation on delivering at the speed of need. So I'm providing the first perspective focused on intake and scoping, then you'll hear from Katie and Honey. And so the first section is going to focus on knowing your context, and then we'll talk about anchoring the work, and then we'll talk about making things tangible. And just to let you know, the first two sections are longer, and the last section is a little bit shorter, and then I'll hand it over to Katie. So. Let's start with knowing your context. So without a strategy, product decisions are hard. And particularly in the context of COVID-19, we have a situation where often we're getting urgent requests for digital products and services that need to be provided because in many cases for many digital organizations, almost overnight, their digital service is their primary interface with their end users. And so in organizations that have a clear digital strategy, these product decisions are often very easy because they can be considered with reference to the broader vision. But in those organizations that haven't traditionally considered themselves as a digital organization or they haven't necessarily taken the time yet to create that digital strategy, making product decisions is really, really hard. So uh, I'd say that in the context of COVID-19, one of the most common things is organizations who need a product, but they lack a strategy, hence the product decision conversations are really hard. So at the mayor's office of the CTO in New York, one of the ways in which we started to broach these conversations and understand the context of our, of our partners or someone who's looking to get some support on a digital product is to help anchor these projects um, and discussions around digital strategy around things that are familiar. And the reason for that is a lot of organizations that don't consider themselves you know, digital first organizations yet might not be familiar with how to approach some of these digital strategy conversations. So when you anchor it in something that people have used before, for instance, an e-commerce example, it's a lot easier to have those discussions. And at the design lab, which is in the CTO in New York, that's something they've had a lot of success doing. So a small example of one of these familiar tools we use, <clears throat> excuse me, as a provocation is helping people to think through something like a single front door approach versus a direct access approach. And of course, as you can see on the slide here, this is a very common thing that you see in e-commerce. One isn't necessarily better than the other, but in a single front door approach, this is one entry into something that, that lets you see a whole bunch of different options. They might be in a variable you know, quality of experience. If you're booking a flight, you might be rooted through Frankfurt. It might have like a 12 hour delay. Maybe you're into that, maybe you're not. Versus a direct access approach, 
a person has maybe a very clear idea in their mind of exactly what they need. They like Singapore Air, they wanna fly Singapore Air and they go directly to that service. So this is just an example of as you approach a digital product, are you building something more like a single front door or direct access? One isn't necessarily better, but it depends on what you're trying to do. What's your business model? What's your value proposition? So this is an example of how understanding the context of your organization or your partner is what enables you to move quickly and move at that speed of need. Now in normal times, one of the ways you would do this is through a rigorous digital maturity assessment. And there are some really robust tools out there. I, I wouldn't suggest people invent their own things like the GDS, GDS model, the Harvard Kennedy School model, um, or the Ontario digital service approach. Those are excellent and refined tools that, that people have spent a lot of time using. So I suggest you take a look at them. But in executing these models, this isn't something you can do on a 30 minute call. This is a robust engagement. And it's also politically challenging to go through these sorts of models with a partner. You can go online and look at these, some of these questions now and you'll see that they're kind of awkward to ask about. Now, the good news is, if you're trying to move at the speed of need, we have some proxy measures that help you get to some of the things that would come up in a more robust assessment or something that if you had more time you'd do, but it lets you just sort of cut to the chase really quickly. So these are simple questions that help to expose the critical truth. However, I will flag that it is still a little bit politically awkward to ask, and you could even argue it's harder when it's these proxy questions, because you haven't had the rapport building opportunity that you'd have if you spent more time uh, going through a more robust model. But sometimes we don't always have that luxury. So I wanna go through some examples of what this looks like in practice. I believe Katie has dropped into the channel the link to our cheat sheet. If she hasn't, I'm sure she will shortly or someone will. So I'm gonna run through a bunch of questions and don't feel pressured to um, write all these down because you'll get them afterwards. But what I want you to do is think about these questions and put on either the hat of you working in your organization right now or feel free to put yourself in the shoes of one of your partners. So use the chat to answer some of these questions if you feel comfortable in doing so. We did a previous run of this workshop and it was really awesome to see some of the comments. So please feel free to do that. But if you're more comfortable to write it down on that pen and paper that you have with you, please feel free to do that. But I'll start with showing you three quick proxy measure questions that can help you orient yourself to your partner's context. So the first one that I like to ask about is the person's vision for their digital services. And so the question I like to ask is, tell me about your digital vision and who owns this? So right now, if you want, you can pop an answer to that question in the chat. And when I ask this question about digital vision and who owns it, the thing that I'm looking to see is firstly, do they have a plan? And it's totally fine if they don't know, uh, we can work with that. But knowing the difference really helps you understand where your partner is coming from. Another question I like to ask is around design. So this is kind of a two part question. The first part is about, tell me, the, tell me about the last time you conducted user research. And then I ask people to tell me about how they've incorporated that user research into the product design or product vision. So feel free to plop an answer into the Zoom chat there. But what I'd be looking for when I ask a question like that is has user research ever been done? I mean, that's just the first question. Because if it's the first time they've ever done it, that's a completely different approach than if they've done it a bunch. How often are they doing it? And where did the learnings go? The next question I like to ask about is accessibility. And again, this is a two-part question as well. So the first part is, it doesn't sound like I'm getting at accessibility, but stick with me here. The first part is, tell me about your plans for, uh, about how your plans for digital services relate to your ongoing services. So this is getting at actually multi-channel and you know, do they have a clear vision about how people switch between a face-to-face -face service or an online service or a telephony service and how that's being managed today. And then part of the reason I'm asking that is because we want to ensure that people aren't being left behind. And so we can ask, what are your plans to ensure that nobody's left behind? If they have a you know, very robust telephony service, it's easy um, to ensure that people are coached through a, a digital service if that's the, the service design that people want to build. But what you're asking about here is, and looking to see is, has this been thought through? Is there a clear plan? Has it been actioned? Who's in charge of it? And that's gonna tell you a lot about if people are gonna be left behind or not. Now I also have two bonus questions. These are not for the faint of heart. This is if you're really feeling quite bold. You might wanna ask a question that I've actually stolen from Alice, Alex Bisker, who used to be uh, the COO at 18F. And this is such a great question. It's a two-parter as well. Do you plan to do less digital work next year than this year? 
And I love this question because actually it's a little bit of a trick question because no one ever says, yes, I plan to do less digital work next year. So then you get to follow up and say, so what digital investment decisions are you making to align with those plans for growth? So that's a little bit controversial, but it's an excellent question. And then the final question I like to ask is about transformation. And so this one I have also stolen from someone, but I feel like it's hardly stealing if she's on the call. This is from Honey, and she has a blog on this, so I suggest that you read it in full. But this question about transformation is, how much do you really want to change? And so this is such an important question because the fact is that digitally sophisticated organizations in the internet era work very differently than those organizations uh, who were existing in the pre-internet era. So what I'm talking about here is about organizational structure, about decision making, about power dynamics, and those, as Honey would say, are very awkward questions. And so more clearly, what I'm getting at here is that I've never seen an organization approach a digital transformation exercise and say, oh, you know what? I'm really prepared to completely disrupt everything about how we do things. Like nobody says that. And, and so part of the question about how much do you really wanna change is getting at the fact that a lot of people want the benefits of the digital transformation, but haven't thought through some of the disruption or the, the bumpy road that, that gets us there. And so this sort of helps caveat the fact that as we go through this work and as we make a digital product, even a fantastic digital product is going to be somewhat uncomfortable as we move through it and, and decision making hierarchies, you know, get changed around. And those are things that Honey and Katie are going to touch on uh, shortly. So please check out Honey's blog on this because it's been very well documented there. So to summarize uh, this section that I wanted to talk about, what I'm, ta what I'm, I'm trying to get at here is understand the context of your partner by asking questions and assessing digital maturity. Because when you're trying to move at the speed of need, you're not going to have time to tiptoe around these awkward questions. You just need to ask them upfront and orient yourself um, to your partner's context and environment. So the next section I wanna talk about is anchoring the work. And so I'd like to start by getting you to sort of think about the outset of a new project. You know, when you've like got that new partner and things are going super well and everyone has really high hopes for the art of the possible and they're imagining how this technology product is gonna come in and it's gonna solve these sort of long-standing issues and everyone's feeling really positive and imagining all the bells and whistles. And it's so important when you have that momentum with a partner and you're working in that way that you immediately crush that energy and break everybody's heart. I'm partly joking here. What I'm trying to get at is that you cannot assume that because things are going smoothly, that uh, there are no issues. Actually, I think it's the opposite. In my experience, if things are going really smoothly, it means that people are not addressing the elephant in the room. As I said a moment ago, excellent work can sometimes be uncomfortable and disruptive. And if that's not coming up anywhere, I would be really, really worried about where that's gonna manifest. And, and probably where it will is way downstream at the worst possible moment in time. So what you wanna do is bring those tough conversations upstream, upstream leverage that positive momentum that you have from the honeymoon period, the fact that people are still um, feeling really enthusiastic and, and leverage that to bring up those awkward conversations and move out of that honeymoon period into a period of realism where you can really be clear about what's gonna be achieved by whom and in what time frame. And so when I talk about that, what I'm really talking about is outlining scope early. So on the right hand side of the slide here, you've got now, next and later. And of course that's about defining an MVP talking about what is critical, what can be in a prioritized backlog, and what is known versus hypothesized, because you never wanna get those hypotheticals um, in your product backlog if you don't have a clear way to validate it, otherwise then you're building for assumptions and uh, that's gonna introduce unknown risk, or, or unnecessary risk, excuse me. The next thing you wanna do is also anchor yourself in the product life cycle. So I know that this is a bit of a crude assessment and not everybody loves this framing, but the discovery alpha, beta, and live framework is an excellent way to anchor the approach to a product and start getting people oriented to what's being, what's gonna be built and roughly what the timeframes are. So of course, most people should be starting here at discovery. And of course, most people will want to be starting directly with a live service. And the way in which you, you broker those conversations in part is to anchor it in what defines a discovery or an alpha or a beta or a, a live service. And I will tell you that when you do this, one of the first things that might happen is people will say, oh, well, that's just like one woman's opinion of how long these things take. 
And so this is where it's really helpful to leverage and lean on the credibility of some of our peers and other digital government teams and say, well, it's not just one woman's opinion. You can lean on the evidence from the uh, Treasury Board Secretariat, which is where I took this slide. And it's their opinion that, of course, a, a beta might take about 24 weeks. And if you don't like that, you can maybe look at how the government digital service in the UK does it, or how the Ontario digital service does it, or how the digital transformation agency in Australia does it. The point being here that there is a particular framework that people use, and it's not sort of a, oh, that's one interesting perspective. It's a pretty robustly proven model. Of course, nothing is a guarantee, but in following some of these well-established models, it's a way to mitigate risk. So one of the key takeaways here then is to frame these product life cycle conversations around risk. Specifically, what are you building? Because if you're building an alpha service versus a live service, it's a very different set of requirements and acceptance criteria and how will you know you're done? And that tells you about what fidelity the product will be, alpha versus a live service. And this is also where I think those digital service standards and assessments become so important and so helpful because it tells you exactly if you have done it or not. It's an objective measure that you know you can at least measure against. It just it is still not nothing is a perfect 100% tick box exercise, but it really helps to frame and orient you. And so this is really about managing expectations and doing quality assurance through something like a standard or an assessment model and framing all of that around a way of reducing risk as you approach a digital product when you have to move really quickly. So if you want to workshop this a bit, I'd like to talk about this famous test that I'm sure we've all done in elementary school, which is the jelly bean test. And I know this is a recorded session, and I don't know how many people are watching this right now, but it's, of course, a top secret approach that I hope never leaves this very secretive group of online people. But this is the jelly bean test. And so this is anchored in the theory of planning fallacy. So people like Daniel Kahneman, Nobel laureate, where the, the thing that we're getting at here is that people tend to overestimate and have optimism bias about how much they can achieve and then underestimate the uh, cost and energy and resources required to do a thing. So the jelly bean test, and I mean, if you take nothing from this workshop other than the jelly bean test, I might be happy about that, is when you're going to ask three different people to look at this jar of jelly beans and you want them to guess how many jelly beans are in the jar. Now, of course, the jar is something that is well-defined and has no external dependencies, unlike every digital government project, which often has many external dependencies. And so if you can get all three people to agree on how many jelly beans are in that jar, then you are permitted to give them a precise estimate on exactly what features and how long it will take to get the product you're being asked to build. Now, of course, this is also a provocation because I like those types of things. What I'm getting at here is don't whimsically set timelines or do estimations. It is incredibly difficult to estimate timelines accurately. And the only way I've seen it done well is if you have an agile team who's worked together for so long that they have a long history of doing sprints together. They have a long and consistent history of doing breaking down their epics into stories and understanding how long it takes them to work through that. And those teams may be able to plot a burn down chart or project their velocity. But I've never seen that done in government. It's not that government people can't do it. It's that often in government teams, we're reshuffling our teams frequently enough that you're not able to get that long tail that you'd use to project forward. So all this to say that technically it is possible, but I've never seen it done uh, particularly well in government because we're constrained by our teams often changing. So don't attempt to try to estimate something that you're not sure about. It's, it's a way to set yourself up for failure. So Oops, there you go. So what I'm trying to do here is, is show these provocations or show these questions that help you anchor difficult questions and bring items to the surface so that you don't have to be the uncomfortable, awkward person who's always asking these kind of not fun questions. So I'm going to give you one more example that's slightly less fun, but very practical and helpful. And that's when you start with a new digital product team and partner, get them to start by writing a problem statement, which I hope most people are already doing. If you're not familiar with the format, which I'm sure you are because everyone tends to sort of use this generally, um, we like to use the problem statement in the user story format. So as a user, I need a thing so I can goal. As a unicorn owner, this is a, a ridiculous government example. I need a registry so I can lawfully ride my unicorn. This is the type of thing we might make in government. And so once you have a prob problem statement with your partner, do something like sit down and try to imaginarily conduct user research tomorrow. 
So I don't mean literally go and do user research tomorrow. And I don't mean sit down and plan out your exact team because Honey's going to talk, excuse me, Katie's going to talk about that in a second. And Honey's going to talk about the governance. But I mean, chew over what it would take if you actually were asked to tomorrow do a user research session for some sort of new unicorn registry service. How would you go about doing this? So in the channel, I know I think we have a 40 second delay, so I am, and I'm not able to see the comments, but feel free to drop in what you think your first couple of things would be if you were tasked with trying to do user research on this new thing. But if it were me, some of the first things I would do is think about the topic guide. Who can write it? Do we have anyone around who can write it? Do we need someone to have approval for a topic guide? This isn't because you're literally about to write a topic guide. It's because you're trying to work through with your partner. Do we have a process for managing this yet? And, and how do they respond when you suggest that we're going to do a topic guide? Recruitment is an excellent one because people are often very um, anxious when we say we're going to go out and talk to unicorn owners about their experience owning unicorns. So do you have any market segments particularly that you're trying to target, particularly underheard groups who maybe we want included? How do you plan to do that? This is something to talk about with your partner. Who's going to turn analysis of that user research into prototyping? So this is one of the hardest skill sets to find in government, the people who can both conduct a user research interview, transcribe that interview, and then turn that into a clickable prototype all within 24 hours. Do you have people who can do that? And when you say that to a partner, how do they respond? And then finally, how does that partner view user research? Do they consider it a team sport? Do they expect it to be outsourced to their design team and they don't want to touch it? Or do they anticipate locking off their schedule and attending each and every one of those sessions? So these are just examples of the types of things that you can use to have these conversations with your partners. And so what you're trying to do here is to anchor things into something tangible so that you can start to scope the project appropriately. Oops, as I drop my clicker, hold on. Ugh. And knock over my light. All right, we're good. So you can, uh, hold on. There we go, we're good. So you can scope your project accordingly. So I think we're good. Yeah. So the reason you need to do this is if you wait until the point at which you're trying to scope your team, and that's what Katie's about to talk about, what you'll find is it might be a little bit late or some of these things become unnecessarily complicated because your partner hasn't been prepared to start thinking about these things. So do it upstream, do it as a provocation, and it will help to sort of move this process along swiftly. So the final thing is to make things tangible. And this is gonna be our shortest thing and our most fun thing, though slightly less fun than knocking a light over while dropping your clicker. So this is gonna be a workshop thing. And what I'd like you to do is either use your pen and paper or feel free to close your eyes and just imagine a house with windows on the mountain. So, Imagine what the house would look like, how many windows it might have, where it would be positioned on the mountains. And maybe what you're imagining is this uh, beautiful house in Spain, an expensive and ambitious project. It is a bespoke project, custom built. Maybe what you're imagining is the Whistler Hemloft, which is an off the grid, off the grid public use project, apparently you can just go use it, made of salvage materials where no planning permissions, as far as I know, were granted. So they kind of went rogue. Or maybe if you're me, you've gone for this $22,000 prefab off the shelf thing, which, okay, to be fair, is not exactly on the mountains. And, you know, maybe doesn't have every feature you wanted, but hey, you know, it's off the shelf, it's prefab, very easy. What I'm getting at here is a metaphor. And the metaphor, of course, is software. Do you want something custom? Do you want to go a little bit rogue? Do you want to have something that is just off the shelf and easy to use? It doesn't actually matter necessarily which route you go, but each of us was probably imagining and or sketching poorly a different idea of what that mountain, uh, house on the mountain with windows looked like. So when you make things tangible, what you're doing is ensuring that everybody is on the same page. And this is the power of the sacrificial prototype. This is the power of show and tells where you're showing work in progress. And of course, it's often a little bit performative, but we're simultaneously doing culture change while also building the product. And this is me doing a show and tell of paper prototypes. Anyone who's seen my sketching knows it's terrible, but it's about resisting the temptation to polish the work, inviting friendlies to, to come and, and to give their feedback and to awkwardly call out any of those elephants that you have in the room to make sure that, that those conversations aren't happening too far down the line. So as I close and hand over to Katie to talk, I'll give you a quote that was said by no one ever, which is that 
A written brief would have made the product development work more clear. Everybody knows that's nonsense. If you want to avoid the, this isn't what I expected issues, you do that by making things tangible, by making them up front, and by having some of these awkward conversations during the scoping and intake process. So that is all from me. I'm going to now attempt to unshare my screen so Katie can take over. Please bear with me. Oh, now I can do it. Wonderful. All right. Thanks, everyone. Looking forward to seeing your comments in the chat. Thank you, Catherine. You're always a very tough act to follow, I will admit. And so I will uh, do my very best to do just that. Hi, everyone. As I mentioned at the top, my name is uh, Katie Lalonde, and I'm a director with the Ontario Digital Service. I have uh, the joy today of talking to you a little bit about our second piece of the puzzle, which is how do you build agile multidisciplinary teams. I'm going to break this down a bit and we'll do some workshop questions in between as well to make sure that uh, we're giving some interactive pieces to it to build on the unicorn registry that we're all creating in our heads. And then I'll hand things over afterwards to Honey to talk about governance. But first, I just want to set a little bit of context of who I am and what uh, I'm up to. So I work with the Ontario Digital Service, which is the kind of digital, central digital organization organization within the Ontario government. We're designed to deploy teams to rapidly build digital tools that help Ontarians access easy to understand information and data. I've listed our outcomes here. This gets to kind of Catherine's first bit about what vision we're driving towards. And so we are looking to build high quality digital services to make Ontario the most digitally advanced government in Canada, a leader across international jurisdictions, which I think there's many on this call who will dispute us for this title, but we're still gonna go for it anyway. And of course that last one, which is to, to design uh, services that are well-designed and operate efficiently and effectively. So to start with, I want to start a little bit on this idea of agile teams. This is our goal today. If I were to say, like, what's the end goal of building teams? It is small, multidisciplinary teams designed to support agile methods and faster delivery who have end-to-end -end responsibility for a product or service and work to deliver on those user needs. First, diving in, of course, is to that agile piece and what that looks like. And so I think this is a, a diagram that probably many people are familiar with in terms of how you do iterative or agile uh, delivery. This requires for us a movement away from beginning with solutions in mind and instead starting our work with a focus on problem statements, which we can then verify with data and user research. It's about taking that iterative approach, starting small and then continuously working to improve our programs and services to ensure they meet the evolving needs of people and businesses. And I think in government, one of the big challenges that we have is keeping this iterative cycle going and not having something kind of spin it off and turn it into a flatter uh, cycle that government might be more used to. And so as we're kind of digging into what this looks like, I want to want you to start thinking about a few of the things that Catherine brought to mind as well, which is things like how can we establish that clear scope and problem statement? How do you understand what phase you're in? So are you, you know, the, this iterative cycle runs throughout all of those phases, whether you're in discovery, alpha, beta, or live, you're still running these discovery sprints. So having a deep understanding of what phase you're in can also help you understand what types of people you might need on your team. And so if you're in a discovery sprint, you're going to need very different people than you might need if you're building a beta. You might need more user researchers. By beta, you'll need more uh, technical capacity. And so you just Understanding the phase you're in and where you're in in your iterative cycle can really help you start to frame what types of roles you need on your team. And the other piece that I think is really key, as, as particular in government, is understanding the map uh, and the landscape of the key players who are around it. Because it's not always going to be just your delivery team. You're often developing something with a partner in a different department or different ministry. You might be going across multiple teams and need different players. If you're on a digital team and you're working with uh, the IT department, you might need to connect with them as well. So start to get in your mind a map of who these different players are. Because one thing that we know is that as you're trying to work through these cycles in government, there's actually these kind of pieces that you need to add in in government that could easily move you off of your cycle. And so having that in mind and starting to think about the roles on your team as you're bringing this to life is really helpful because you will need things like partner buy-in. It's government. So we know that approvals processes do not move in these nice little circles that you can move really quickly through sprints, that they are actually a much bigger piece of the puzzle. And so as you're starting to build your team and the roles you need on your team, uh, start to think about what these other pieces are that you need to layer in in order to make sure that you can run these agile delivery teams within a government context. 
Uh, so throughout uh, my presentation today, I'm going to talk through a couple of examples. So obviously over the last many months, uh, the Ontario Digital Service has been heavily focused on uh, COVID response and building COVID uh, related products to help in the government's response. I'll highlight a few examples of these. Uh, there are many more that we've been working on, but I want to touch on a few of the different ways that we've been looking to build integrated pro products and how each different product has a slightly different team involved and in the thinking behind going into that. And so things like the COVID alert app, which was obviously a great product that was launched by the Canadian digital service, but each province obviously has a big role to play in that. So I'll talk a bit about the team we put together for that. Our self-assessment tool, which we actually based off of open source code from Alberta, and then has also spun off into many other products as well. So we have a great self-assessment tool, which has also become a student screening tool and a courthouse screening tool. It also has an assessments in our location finder built right into it as well, and that is a separate product. And then, of course, our COVID website. So how you can present, like, what does web content and data look like, and how do you build a digital team in order to make sure that you can provide that really up-to-date public health guidance in a really clear, accessible way. So to get started, I want you to think of a project. You can use your own project or you can use your unicorn registry project from part one. And before we really dive into different layers of this, first, I want you to think about what the scope of the project is. So as you think about how your problem statement is framed, either in the chat, if you'd like, or on your piece of paper, think about what roles you think you're going to need on your team. And then I also want you to think about what phase that you're in. Are you in a discovery phase? How will that change the roles you need in the, on a team versus whether you're in an alpha or beta phase? And then also think about the landscape that you're in. What are those, what does your partner map look like and who else might need to be involved in your team? And so I hope you are all typing in the chat, uh, which I can't actually see when I share my screen. So I, I will move along, but this is all on our cheat sheet as well. So you can start to think through what this looks like and what your team will start to build towards. So the next piece. So now I want to layer in a little bit around this idea of multidisciplinary and what it looks like to have a multidisciplinary team. So obviously this is a key piece to what our end goal really was is that this piece around like what does it mean to bring different people together in order to enable that rapid deployment and that rapid development of services. So often when you hear multidisciplinary teams, what you actually hear about is what's on the left. So those big categories, things like content and data, experience design, policy, product, and technology. But what I want you to start thinking about is also how do you break these roles down? Because there are actually so many different components to each of these, and each product will actually need a different component of each. So if you think of something like technology, if you're building a service that needs to connect to a backend database, for example, you're going to need some, a backend developer. You might need a specialized developer who specializes in things like Salesforce or Oracle or any of those big databases that government uses. You're going to need front end devs, back end devs. You're going to need uh, DevOps if you're deploying it in the cloud. And so making sure that you understand how you can break down each of these roles and even I mean the ones I've presented here are even just a snapshot of the possible roles that you might need and the different types of roles in each of these but make sure that as you're starting to dig into what your product team looks like it's not just I need a content person it's what kind of content person do you need and what are the different skills that you'll need to deploy over the course of the product. So of course, this is them deployed onto your product team. So your product team becomes this mix of people who work together in an empowered way in order to develop your product. And so I've given an, an example here, but I also wanna build out some real world examples. So our COVID products. So one example, our COVID alert product. So this was a product that a lot of the development work was done by the Canadian Digital Service. We did lend them a couple of developers, but they weren't on our product team. And so our product team actually looked a little bit different. It was actually much more policy focused because we were focused on things like bringing together Ontario stakeholders, ensuring we had the right privacy protections in place. We had communication support as well, because obviously communicating and getting people to adopt it is a huge piece of it. Then, but if you look at something like our self-assessment tool, it's much more of a like traditional delivery team. And they're set up to do everything they need to do, whether it's a pro they have a product manager, a designer, content advisor, quite a few developers, because there is a connection on the back end to a health database so that we're making sure we're sharing the information we collect through that. So public health can use that to make decisions. Obviously, user research, analytics to make sure we have our analytics in place. QA is a very important and oft forgot role until the day before you ship and you realize you should probably have somebody doing QA. And that's a really important one, how much of that you can automate versus how much you need somebody to help dig in and do it. Uh, and then if you look at something like the website where we actually got into quite a few data visualizations and data pieces as well. So we also added a day, one of our, somebody from our open data team was a big player on that space. So how you start to break down these roles and piece them together into product teams 
really depends on the product you're building and the phase that you're in. So this is also just a snapshot in time. During different phases of these, it might have been different. For example, our website was actually started from our prototyping lab. So it was originally built as a concept and a prototype by our lab, which consists of our lab lead as well as uh, co-op students. And they were able to put together a design for a website, a new web COVID website, within a couple of days, which we were then able to pitch to our executives and they loved it. And so then we built a product team after that and were able to build out what the rest of the roles would look like and it continues to evolve. Now, the next concept that I want to introduce is this idea of actually layers of teams. So the teams that I present on, on the slide before, we're really starting to get into this core team. So what is your core team, which is your small, like you that smallest factor of multidisciplinary team that can make decisions and iterate freely on a product. Then there's also the extended team. So these are the roles and the touch points the team will need to deliver the product. So that next layer out, they might not be on there every single day, but they might be the people who scrub in every once in a while. Maybe they help you with shipping. Maybe they're a ministry partner who has policy or program expertise. That's that next layer out. And then the final layer is actually the steering team. So who are those decision makers? Who are the people who need to go to your show and tells to see your products and what does that look like? Breaking down one example, which is our self-assessment tool, let's look at kind of how that would have looked like. So our core team is this. Our core team is a product manager, a designer, a content advisor, and a couple of developers. So these are the people working every day on the product and the ones that are scrubbed in in order to share that. When you start to look at the extended team, that's where we get into things like user research, web analytics, QA, DevOps. In the Ontario Digital Service, these roles are often actually common across many teams. So we have a user research lab uh, that's able to scrub in and do user research on multiple products. So they might not be dedicated, but they'll support multiple products at, a same, at the same time. Same with our DevOps team and our web analytics uh, person. We don't actually have a team, we just have one guy, but they're able to do that across multiple products at the same time. So they end up being part of the extended team because they don't need to be deployed full-time to that team. This one also had a number of other product, uh, people scrubbed into it. And so things like communications who are able to help with marketing and the announcements piece of it, uh, the different program areas for the self-assessment tool, we worked really closely with the chief medical officer of health in that office because they're the ones, they were the program owners who were providing content and ensuring that the tool met the public health guidance. Also think, as Catherine mentioned, that this is part of an integrated service. So some of our services also had to connect into things like call centers. At, this, at one point for the self-assessment tool, there was a feature where if you got a result that said you you might have COVID, they would do a follow-up call from a med student. And so it actually had to connect into this offline service as well and start to integrate into those other pieces. And so there's quite a few other areas that end up becoming involved and this becomes your extended team and what that looks like. In terms of the steering team, the steering team in this case uh, was fairly extensive because there's quite a few approvals and stakeholders involved in our COVID response. Obviously, it's a very uh, high profile thing. And so the Ontario Digital Service had a role. Our cabinet office, which runs our central communications, was a, a big stakeholder. The health, obviously, the health IT cluster. So a, being able to connect into their back end system. And as I mentioned, the chief medical officer of health office. So what we use the steering team as and what we started to get them into the rhythm of is this idea of show and tells, doing stand-ups, doing by weeks. When we were approaching our first product launch, our stand-ups were every day or every other day. We were then able to spread them out to every week or every month and create a little bit of more space between them as we kind of got into a bit better rhythm of how we're shipping things. But essentially, this is the group that we went to with our prototypes, with our stage environments, with the questions or the blockers we have, and they were able to help us work through those and clear them and help us get each iteration out the door. So we've introduced two new co components since we last, since you last did your team. So now I want you to think through kind of how each of these elements really get into what, what your team might look like. So first, multidisciplinary. If in the first round you wrote down, I need some experienced designers, start to think about what type of experienced designers. Is it interaction design that you need? Is it user research? Is it somebody who can build those pieces together? And then I also want you to start thinking about what who's on your core team versus your extended team versus your steering committee. So start to outline how each of these will play together and what those different roles will look like. And you should have a much more extensive view of what that is. So the final piece I want to touch on is the idea is leadership and the role that kind of horizontal leadership can play can play in helping you build your services. And so traditionally government is organized into silos. It's what we're good at. Even within the Ontario Digital Service, you know, we still have three ADMs and then you have branches underneath those, units underneath that, teams underneath that. And we build these traditionally these kind of silos in government within one ministry, within one branch, we still manage to sort ourselves into these like neat little rows. 
So what I want to posit is that there's actually a big gap here, and that is in some somebody to bring together the work across and provide what we're looking for, which is that really integrated service experience. And so the idea of horizontal leadership and how you can use a kind of horizontal row in order to help uh, build better services, but also in order to build services faster and, and create a more open flow of communication. So the advantages of horizontal leadership are it allows for better coordination, uh, particularly if you have common partners across teams. So if we had developed each one of these kind of COVID products in a separate bucket and not had somebody who was common across, each one of them would have been going to the same partners over and over again. Uh, we would have been, seen a lot of overlap between our products. It also gives you this view of the end-to-end -end journey between a product. So as you're, you go to the, our main COVID website, how is it helping you get to the self-assessment tool? How is it helping you get to the COVID alert app? As you're in the self-assessment tool, how are you getting to finding a testing location? How are you moving between products and what does that look like? So it does provide that view across multiple products that allows you to really understand what that end-to-end -end journey could be. And of course, from a kind of individual point of view, it's also how can you quickly redeploy or refocus people in teams? So if you have this view and you sit, you, I can see coming up on the self-assessment tool, they're gonna need an extra person to help with some data and cleaning up some data. I know this team over here has a data person who's not that busy this week. I can quickly be able to look between the teams and start to think about as we move through these different product life cycles. And as you move through the different needs on the teams, how can you move people around a little bit more easily? And how can you set your teams up to allow for that fluidity between it. And then those core functions that we have running along the bottom in the Ontario Digital Service, like the User Research Lab and like DevOps, how can we start to queue things up so that they're able to scrub in at the time needed and you're not deploying everything in one week. Although sometimes that is unavoidable and we have done that too many product deployments in one week does sometimes happen. And one thing I wanna highlight about this horizontal leadership role is that on the diagram it was like this big red block uh, that kind of looks like it's just stopping everything in its path. And so the role of that horizontal leader and the types of things that that person should be asking in order to enable this kind of rapid delivery of products are things like ensuring the, are you solving for the right problem? Like, are we asking the right questions? Are we solving for the right problem? Do you have the right team in place? Uh, does that team have what it needs to be successful or is there some sort of blocker or some other need that they that you can help them get? Do you have the right people at your governance table and do they understand the user need that you're solving towards? And so getting back to that, what Catherine talked about in the first piece is like, what, do they have that understanding of what user research is and how it contributes? Do they understand that we're building something for a user? And then also that, that last piece, which is really important, is that do the people at your governance table understand digital approaches? So are they going to get scared by agile delivery? Are they going uh, to not look favorably upon user research? Are they comfortable with these kind of traditional ways of approaching digital projects that might kind of get that circle into that waterfall? And how can you keep helping them move in that circle? And so I think that level of leadership ends up being a really important piece. So for our COVID products, I was lucky enough to play that role. That's me uh, there, but we had we had a number of products operating across our three. So we have three in the Ontario government, we call them assistant deputy ministers. We have one for digital, one for lean and one for platforms. And we had a number of COVID products with that kind of single director who was reporting to all three ADMs on those. And that continues. We put that in place within the first 24 hours of the, the MBA shutting down back in March and we were all scrambling with our COVID. We said, you know what, we need one person who's just doing our COVID response. And that continues to this day. And then we also have these great people, our, our discipline chapter managers who are helping our teams and really act as that, uh, as we call them, the shit umbrella to help make sure that everybody has what they need as well. And so between that kind of coordinated leadership and our, our discipline managers, we're able to provide teams the support they need in order to get things done and work with our partners. So uh, the final piece of your workshopping. So I want you to think about who is your shit umbrella? Who are they and how are they helping you get things done? And then is there an opportunity for horizontal leadership? What are the products that would be under that horizontal piece that need that connection between and who would provide that role in your organization? All right, so that's it for me. The key piece to making this all happen is, of course, governance. And so I will hand things over to Honey. But first, I just want to say, if you want to work on a multidisciplinary agile team and you think, wow, Ontario is doing awesome things because we are, I encourage you to go to Ontario.ca slash digital jobs because we will, with any luck, be hiring very soon. Thanks, Katie. Um, I, I get the least fun part in that I get to follow the two of you and then I get to talk about governance. In that, 
And it's one of those words that I remember actually signing up for it. It's one, one of the things that I'm obsessed with next to the word bureaucracy, but that's not really the, um, I guess the whole point though, is that we want to um, change how things work. And uh, before I share my screen, I'm very curious, I'll just as a quick um, thing on chat, I'm curious how many people here consider themselves part of a core team. Yeah, no, yes. Okay, seeing some nods, seeing some entries on the chats. The extended team or the steering committee or part of governance. Awesome. Okay, there's a bit of, um, and I think some people are all of the above. There you go. Okay, I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Everybody see it? Awesome. And we can see you. Yay, okay. So for the last hour, we've heard about what it takes to deliver the digital way and what it means to have agile empowered multidisciplinary teams. So for this last bit, we are going to talk about governance. So first, the definition. And this first one is something I'm offering up as something for us to react to. And so in part to highlight what good governance can look like, because what is it really? I mean, it's there so that our organizations can do the right things the right way. And then, of course, we surface all those things that are required to run all our organizations. So issues around ownership, accountability, decision-making authority, and the design, development, implementation of all our services. And so why do we hate it so much? Let's just get right to why. Honestly, there are many reasons. One I, I hear the most often is the thankless admin overhead. But there's a bit of a clue here that in this ISO definition of governance, and it's this thing, this focus on it being for senior management to gain and give assurance that investment generates value to the business and reduces the risk of bad outcomes. Now, there's nothing necessarily bad about this particular definition. It's just that it causes us to focus way too narrowly on the and probably on the wrong things. And so with this construct, it means that we think of senior managers' jobs as gathering data from teams, holding them to account, and nothing at all about supporting them and blocking or finding help about the, nothing at all about anything you've heard from Katie's presentation. And then of course, the framing is always around cost savings and delivering a thing, but not about its broader impact or outcome. And of course, the only risk it seems to be is around overspending, project delays, and security. And again, all of those are legitimate risks. It's just that we don't talk about the things that are also equally important, perhaps more so, achieving that outcome, the intentions that you have for the projects that you're undertaking. And so just like the tracking documents, the artifacts, the meetings that are created, it's always seems to be about hitting some random target, but altogether missing the point. So my talk has three parts, sort of following the same pattern as Catherine and Katie. And so um, governance for me and what we're learning in this pandemic has short, medium, and long-term things. And if you're involved in the business of decision-making or pretty much care about this part of government, you're always balancing short, medium, and long-term. And all of these things are always at play. So part one of this presentation is all about the short term, how you support a team to deliver, especially during these unprecedented times. Part two is medium term. And so um, how do you capture and document lessons learned so you're able to replicate it? And part three is long term. Yes, we're in the midst of a long term crisis, but what happens when this is over? And so nobody is off the hook from the hard questions. And then, of course, at the end, we're going to do a quick wrap up. First story I'm going to tell you about is about my own team that I'm very proud of at the Canada School of Public Service Digital Academy. And so, as Amanda mentioned earlier, our mission is to introduce digital era mindsets, knowledge, and skills to 289,000 federal public servants. And one of our products is called busrides.ca, so bite-sized learning that you can consume at around the same length as a bus ride in downtown Ottawa. And that's how I understand the origin of the name. During the pandemic, the team crowdsourced put together something called the Remote Work Guide. 
just added some screenshots pretty much for illustration. And so the guide was something that was put together the first week of the lockdown when the public services suddenly told they had to work from home, very little notice, to not connect to VPN, and to figure out how to do their jobs pretty much in the midst of all that uncertainty. And so the team put together resources for managers and staff, topics ranging from tools you can use that are outside the network to sources of mental health wellness advice, both English and French. It was a labor of love, to be honest. Anyway, what's behind the scenes? So uh, the doers versus watchers thing is a useful construct, something that I wish I'd invented. It's actually uh, Mark Schwartz. I, he was at Forward 50 earlier, pretty much talking about this, and it's something he goes at length in his publications. But doers versus watchers is an interesting thing to uh, kind of think about when we think about how we set up our own teams too. And so the team putting together and crowdsourcing all that stuff is pretty much just visually dwarfed in terms of the, by the number of approvers, that's pretty much the ratio right now. So twice as many watchers and doers. And, and this is for a public that, for a product that the public was not going to interact with directly. And so the risk profile should be relatively low in comparison. And now this practice led to somebody actually trying to outline what the approvals process can should look like and actually base it on the risk profile of the article. So this is what the after kind of looks like as an illustration. And anyway, in terms of workshopping this, also causes people to think about how much time in a week does your team get involved in the watching activities versus doing in the form of background documents, dedicated briefing notes and docs that never seem to be ever final, dedicated briefings, endless tracking templates. And so the best digital teams are able to minimize this by delegating authority and by having, and, and so let's also face it, if, it's, if you're not seeing it happen, it's because probably some of your managers are taking on this work. And so to workshop this, one of the things that the team did was to pretty much visualize the path to delivery. And so the list of every single approver and reviewer, and I found this really useful and something that I really want to replicate wherever I go in that for each approver that you list, sort of you find out what are they reviewing? What perspective are they introducing? And what happens if they don't review? Like what is the risk that happens? and I encourage everybody to also think about that. Now, in some cases, when you show this and you visualize this whole path, some people will self-select to leave and actually say, oh wait, you know what? We probably don't need this many approvals. You, this is something that also helps people sort of understand how much admin overhead um, is being spent on the work that's taking away from the real thing. The principles to live by are were already written pretty much by GDS and the UK National Audit Office. So these were pretty much published from 2014 and 2016, respectively. And so the principles around pretty much not slowing down delivery are very real, especially during this time of crisis. And it's quite validating to see all of these things come to life. So don't slow down delivery. Decisions at the right time with the right people at the right level deliverables and not multiple tracking documents. Number four is important in that go and see for yourself. If the team is working on something that's time sensitive and has really big public impact, bend your calendar towards them. And then the fifth, change happens, be ready to adapt. We're not going to, nothing will be perfect right now. We will always um, need to be able to um, pivot as needed. And then part two. And so in the midst of pandemic, pandem we are really also trying to figure out what else we're learning. And, and that's also because the teams are busy delivering. And so there are some things though, where even though I just told you about the admin overhead that we don't like, there's some that's worthwhile. And so, and that's when I'm gonna talk about a micro mission project that um, I was part of. And so Open Call was a partnership between the Canadian Digital Service the Digital Academy and Code for Canada. And so it was two things. And so the first it's, is that it's a catalog of open source digital solutions that have been developed as part of government's responses to COVID. And so it's pretty much something that we were able to put together very quickly. 
And then the other part is it's pro bono digital support to government teams made possible by um, funding from the Canadian Digital Service to Code for Canada. And so um, I'm going to talk less about the actual project, but um, I'm going to talk about what was happening behind the scenes. Because if you could imagine what approvals for something internal facing being bigger, three organizations can very quickly become three of those things. But thankfully, it wasn't. And so right at the beginning, in order to become part of the open call team, we, we were pretty quick and open to, and, and we made the time to talk about who makes the calls on what, when do we want the larger team involved? And whenever we met at that, uh, as that one group, we weren't there taking notes, going back to our own organizations, <laughs> hoping that a decision will be made, but um, actually um, working on the thing. And so uh, we could see the division of labor on this, pretty much how this project pretty much ran. And so here are the things that we did essentially. And so we did workshop this over and over. Sort of, we needed to be clear about what we were gonna be responsible for and when we get to decide. And so inter internally, we needed to talk about who had the capacity, who had the decision-making authority, and, and then also which decisions are shared, what vision is shared, and then the parameters for discussing those decisions. And so in our case, when it came to shared decisions, it, it would be while they're deciding when something in the catalog didn't make sense and just wanted to do a second sort of a second pair of eyes. The other was who was going to brief the minister and also um, it, even just deciding sort of what to do and when to um, kind of move to the next phase of the project. The other thing that we workshop, this is something very similar to what Catherine was hinting at, was pretty much how, how to scope deliverables. And so what are we building exactly? And so a lot of prototypes, a lot of examples for people to react. And then also documenting, because one show and tell to the next, it could be very easy to have a very different interpretation um, of what decisions were made. And the uh, and also for things to start, start to creep because some casual remark was made at the show and tell that all of a sudden became a requirement that inserts itself. And so talk about what is optional if time allows and then talk about what's optional when more money and people are required, but please, it, it's also not the time for heroics. You need to be very clear about what you're delivering and then also what's out of scope and what you're intentionally not working on and why. And so. Some features are, don't make sense, aren't really part of, don't really advance or provide any kind of service, have no grounding in user research, and we need to also outline all of those and constantly revisit. And so part three is probably the one part where I'm going to, I'm going to ask for governments to do something even more ambitious. And partly because I, I'm seeing uh, as a theme in this conference, especially a lot of success stories. And you know what? This is pretty much every digital service team's turn to shine. And so I do not want to diminish that. But I also don't want us to lose sight of our larger mission, which is to pretty much change the way government works. And so nobody is off the hook from these hard questions. And a quick illustration about how amazing uh, things are are happening across government. And so Canada's emergency response benefit was is probably the perfect case study of how much do you want to change in order to deliver something high impact and very quickly. And so um, for millions of people accessing this service, a lot of policy changes needed to happen behind the scenes. And so policy program product teams were working pretty much and all kinds, kinds of decisions that normally would take months and years given the scale of the service were happening in weeks or days. And so um, we've proven out that nothing about the structure of government has changed and nothing about the committees and trackers has changed. However, we also have proven out public servants know how to operate in a crisis, albeit right now we're in a really long-term one. And so um, what does this mean for us? And so here's my very fictional sort of in a post-crisis world no digital team ever will ever say, we can go back to the way things were. And finally, and honestly, no digital team actually ever does say this 
what's really happening behind the scenes is that things actually haven't changed. Those committees exist. Briefing documents are being written. People are maybe not working so much in silos. It's just that some of that work is kind of has been moved to pretty much our um, a lot of our servant leaders. And this is pretty much the substance of my main talk. We want governance to be all about enabling conditions, not just heroics, because it really isn't right to just rely on the passion of public servants and the kindness of shit umbrellas. I love everybody on the thing, and I say that with all the love in my heart, but I also think that we need to think about the longer term things that we need to codify and all these hard won gains. At the end of this pandemic, um, I really don't want our impact to be a catalog of just shiny things and then also, oh, yay, we can work from home. So what would this look like? So how would I workshop something like this? I would advise that pretty much at senior leadership tables or even as teams kind of start to reflect every six months to think about ownership, accountability, decision-making authority, pretty much in the way these services are delivered. So if you have a pen and paper, this is how I would do it. You put a star beside your current state and circle your desired future state in terms of your organization. So what type of stable and coherent leadership structure and accountability needs to be put into place so that new ways of working actually thrive post pandemic? Based on what you know now and what you want, where you want to be in the future, what do you need to set up? Funding model. So what type of funding model is necessary for sustainable and continuously improved services? If at the end of this, we still don't have stable funding for our teams, we've failed. And th that's the hard truth of it. Direction and expectation. Are we asking the right things or are we creating dependencies primarily around um, our standards? And so this one is a topic close to my heart given um, my experience at the ODS and then also where I am today, where I continue to champion digital standards. And so how specific do we want to be about how, what we expect services need to be? What kinds of policy instruments need to be put into place or what kind of guidance? And so we need to be honest about those. Do we expect for capacity building, do we expect digital service teams to be the be all and end all of all digital services or are we gonna set it up so that other teams can deliver across? And then of course, intervention. What happens when there are teams that can't do this and digital teams are often put in this awkward disruptor role in that usually the political staffer will assign the work and ask them to redo it. Not quite how we want it to do um, change or introduce a new concept. So what does that look like? Measurement and evaluation. And so the degree of objectivity um, in terms of when you're assessing how well teams are actually doing and what do we measure? Why does it matter? And then reporting, it's the exposure of that measurement. And so if there's no reporting, it means um, you're, yes, you feel good, but it also holds us to account publicly. So what can that look like for us? So um, I know that some of these things are in the cheat sheet. I'm also going to have a longer post that I'll put online just so that I could, you can access this worksheet for people. And that takes us to the end of the governance part of the workshop. Cool. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Perfect, thank you so much, ladies. We do have about 15 minutes. So what I propose is we have about 10 minutes for questions and then I'll wrap up the workshop session. So there's been a ton of banter. I know you guys have been sharing your screen, so I'm not sure if you were able to see all the amazing feedback you've been getting, but definitely like huge applauses from the audience. I think they've learned quite a bit as have I. So what I'll do is if someone has a question, you can either release yourself off the mic, you can unmute yourself and show yourself on camera, or if you prefer to put it in the comments, we can go 
go that way as well. So if anyone has a question, I'll turn the floor over to you guys and just be mindful of that. It'll be hard to see who's talking. So uh, we'll try to try our best to moderate that if, if folks, there's no raise hand option, I don't think. Yeah, not on, not on Zoom. So yeah, we'll go through either releasing yourself off mute and camera, or you can use the um, chat function. Hi, can, can I ask something? Yeah, go ahead, Lloyd. Yeah, hi, thank you. I, I was very, I guess, I'm just impressed, but I, I found I found that the, you know, the slide about the, the, the stakeholders, like, you know, like the watchers and the doers kind of thing, right? And I, I'm very impressed to hear that in, in the project you described, you're able to cut out all these people. But what I'm thinking of in, in I guess, where I work is that these watchers and doers are at every level I guess of of departments, right? So it's like I have my own many watches, my doers, and then the other guy has many watches and doers. So all these watches, all these watches, you know, like a lot of massive overhead throughout the whole project, right? And how do you cut through all these layers of, of people who just want to be involved to to fulfill a I guess some kind of perceived role? Maybe, I mean, not be perceived. It, it's probably a a a role that's assigned to them, but maybe not an efficiently not an efficiently uh, designed role. You know what I mean? Like one guy to approve this small part, another guy to approve another small part, and then another guy to approve another small part. So they're all kind of needed. But the point is that why do we need like, like you know, so many people to approve these parts in that sense, right? How, how, and then they're all at, at multiple levels, right? How, 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 how do you... I mean, is that something you, you would be familiar with, this kind of uh, organizational, I guess, uh, structure? Because I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like, okay, if, I, if I solve my own problem with my watchers and my doers, I still have to deal with everybody else's watchers too, right? Because they, they can't work until their own watchers approve them, and, and, they, and their own watchers cannot work until their own watchers approve them kind of thing, right? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it, just, just wondering what, what thoughts may have on that. So that's not, a, so not an easy fix. And to be honest, a lot of it is building, like building the relationships in the first place and creating, um, like pretty much developing trust. And that takes longer. It's not an instant sort of, um, we'll visualize this thing. And uh, because most of the time, what my experience anyway has been that when something is not understood, especially when it's a new way of working or a new technology, it's, uh, there's a lot of getting to know, there's a lot of hard work upfront around um, explaining what we do, how we do it, and, and then also trying to better understand where they're coming from. Like, what is the risk that they're trying to, why do they need the part that they're watching out for? So um, what happens when they're not watching it? And so understanding that part of it too, because sometimes they actually do need to be watching it. And uh, so what, what I'm arguing for is not sort of, let's remove all the watchers, but actually have a reasonable sort of, I guess, proportion between watching and doing so that we're not actually stopping the doing from happening. Because sometimes it's the watching becomes the work. And I've seen, like, I've been in teams where it felt like the, the work itself became all about just updating this one briefing deck because, and that it, to the point that the work on the actual product never actually happened or was probably down to like half a day in a week when it should be the other way around. Thanks, honey. I see we have another question from Almer Alethi. Sorry if I pronounced your last name wrong. Feel free to unmute yourself on the mic. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the, for the presentation. It was awesome. Again, on the point of watchers versus doers, the responsibility to eliminate the unneeded watchers. Does this fall directly on senior management or is it a shared, a shared responsibility at all levels? Uh, if it is shared, how, how, how can it be implemented? I'm happy to just talk a little bit about how I would approach it from kind of our teams, which is that is one of the jobs of your uh, Shin Umbrella. Like it is uh, the role of kind of, I talked about that horizontal leadership piece to be asking like, do you have the right people at your governance table? Like, is it the right people? And is it in the right format? To Honey's point is like, sometimes watchers aren't bad as long as they're not, they don't end up for doers, which is how, like, if you get into that show and tell type aspect where you're showing the thing instead of making a deck about the thing that you're trying to show, you can cut out some of that. And so I think it is the job of whoever your kind of internal 
champion is like, who is your shit umbrella? Who is the person that's helping you clear those barriers? What is the management level or executive level that does that for you? And how are they shifting towards that servant leadership model, which is a really important piece of it is like, if you're building a servant leadership model that is supporting your empowered teams, then part of that job is to create the space for them to be empowered teams. And so, I mean, on a really tactical level in terms of like how I approached it or have approached it in the past, one is getting into that show, don't tell approach of like, show the thing, don't brief about the thing. We try to do that with our, everybody from, you know, our immediate, our, leads all the way up to our minister is the like, if there's an opportunity that I can do a demo instead of making a deck about the thing, I'm going to do the demo uh, and getting stakeholders comfortable with that process throughout. And so saying like, I'm going to set up bi-weekly show and tells, you're going to see the product each time. I'm not going to brief you about the product and we're going to run down a list of exactly what we need. And we're going to call people out on the phone to be like, I need this from you. I need this from you. I need this from you. Just on a really tactical level, I would also say like the great power of like resetting a meeting invite, meeting invites get forwarded. They get like, you get, you end up getting these like huge numbers of people. Sometimes it's just like wipe it off and start again, go with like, who are the people that we actually send this to every day? It'll build back up and you wipe it off and start again. But like, just really focus on like cut it, clearing some of the space for the teams to do that. But it should be that person who is providing that kind of servant leadership for the team whose job it is, is to make sure that you have the right people who need to be there. And then maybe sometimes the people who don't need to be there are having some of those difficult conversations to move them into other spaces as well. I think another practical way to do it is in the case of, of the mayor's office of the CTO, we use like a partner agreement or a roles and responsibilities document. And that is when we're writing it. So it's like a template. Every time I use it, duplicate the template, then I sort of populate like 70% of it about vaguely what I know about the project. And then I invite the partners, the immediate partners, and it's like a small group of like five people. And that's where you can start tagging and ask the question of like, literally, who is the human who can approve this? And then usually the answer is like, oh, there's four of them. And so the answer for me will be like, oh, cool. Okay, so all four will come to every single meeting. And then people will say, well, no, I don't want all four people. That's too much time. And so then you have that dance of like, is this something where we can um, delegate authority to one person? Or is there a particular reason that all four need to attend? And I think it depends on sort of what type of project you're working on. You know, if it's incredibly high profile, maybe you do want four people approving it. But in many cases, pushing it to the show and tell is, is a good strategy. So people really like the doers versus watchers, honey. That's the thing about honey slides. They always sort of resonate. Definitely lived experience. I think I'm seeing from the comments. I think a lot of people have lived it, which uh, definitely resonates. We have time for one more question and I can see there's one in the comments and it says, so I get the business intake problem, a chain of business intakes, each one takes weeks to do their thing. How do you respond quickly? And maybe if we can keep the answer just a bit short. So a couple minutes, if that's okay. Could we get a bit more on that question? I don't fully think I understand. Well, Okay, I'm, I'm so sorry. This yeah. actually is Lloyd again. It's just I was thinking about this thing about what you're doing. It's okay. So like for example, I, go, I need to go to a, do a project, right? Or activity, any kind of activity, no matter how small, apparently, you need to go to a business intake process. The first step is one gate, right? The one gate takes maybe a month, two months even to process a business request. Then they will go and trigger business intakes for, for other groups there are stakeholders too, right? That would be another God knows how many weeks to get them involved, right? By the time you have a, like a COVID situation like this, I mean, I'm just wondering, I'm so impressed how you actually got it done so quickly because I will still be waiting for someone to be assigned to my project to my business intake processes. Right? After, after two months, three months, I can imagine I'm still sitting around there, where's my guy? You know, like, I can't do the project without these people. Where's my guy, right? I mean, like, but obviously you are able to overcome these challenges. Your organization is going to recognize that this is not acceptable way to work, right? How how would I be able to, I don't know, pull someone in my organization and say that we can't work this way, right? We can't, we can't say we are serving the interests of anybody by having even the fundamental thing of business initiating processes that take freaking months to do, to do anything, mm -hmm. right? I mean, uh, well... <laughs> So I'll turn over to Honey and Katie because I think they'll also have opinions, but I think one of the fastest ways to do it in a crunch time would be to flag up front that like right away, I would say, this isn't going to happen until insert whatever date is six months in the future. And that is a provocation. Everyone who's listened to my talk knows I like to sort of raise these controversial things. And usually when you say six months, people's like, oh, good Lord, no, not possibly. It must happen. Insert new timeline. And then 
that's where you can have this negotiation where you can say, well, I can tell you now that if we follow business as usual, things are tracking for six months. I mean, I can't change the, the, I can't change the rules. I just follow them. So I think using that upfront to drive the conversation. And then if people say that that's not an acceptable timeline, then you're able to, to propose alternative structures. And as I said, in, in my section, anchoring that around not just one person's opinion, but anchoring that and saying like, here's how other jurisdictions have done this. Uh, with great success and then point to them because that helps it seem not just like one woman's wacky opinion, but actually a legitimate approach used by leading digital government teams globally. I would just add uh, is mapping that stakeholders, like understanding who all of these people are that it needs to go to and bringing them together. Like I can't even tell you how many projects where I, you know, the Ontario Digital Service has been working with a ministry and we need two different branches from the same ministry and they've never talked before and we're the people pulling them together to say like look we you are all involved in this product and you're all going to talk about it together in this room right now and we're going to sort it out and you each need to identify your person who's going to be on our multidisciplinary team and so it is like sometimes the role especially when you're getting a project started and starting to build out that team is to be the the person who pulls everyone together and say i'm not going through this four different times we're coming together we're doing it once and you're going to, and often that is the like, it might be two people who are in a totally different place than they should be talking, but they're not, but your job is to bring them together. And it's just making that happen and finding a way to have those conversations where you can clearly outline like the different roles you'll need. The time, like Catherine said, like start getting into some of those scoping and timeline questions and doing those activities, but really acting as that convener. Honey, did you want to end up with a final note? Pretty much. Uh... So both those points really awesome. And so also, honestly, the chances are uh, everybody for every brilliant idea, this was a, what is it, Wong's Law on Twitter. There were probably 800 people working on this the exact same thing. And so uh, it really matters to know and have that grounding in terms of who your counterparts are in this space and understand sort of what else is happening. Also, um, there are a lot of, it's very easy for, um, for scoping to, um, get, uh, I guess, uh, get out of whack very quickly if you don't sort of ground it in the problem to be solved. And so that's uh, probably it, like getting to that root problem. Perfect. Thank you all so much. So that uh, we're pretty much at time. So on behalf of Ford 50 and all of you in attendance with us today, I wanted to thank Catherine, Katie and Honey once again for joining us and for sharing their experiences, knowledge and tips on designing digital service teams to respond quickly in the time of crisis. This was super timely in terms of where we are at right now and the momentum for digital service teams and delivery continues to grow. 